understanding who God is, what our relationship to God is like. And last week we looked at this idea of the fear of God. And one of the things that we discussed was that the fear of God leads to obedience. The fear of God leads to, in other words, it produces in us something. And the believer, it produces obedience or conviction of sin when you don't obey. Um, but obedience requires a law, right? Uh, without a law, there's nothing to obey. Without um, rules, there's nothing to obey. If we're going to obey God, then God must have set down rules, directions, and instructions. He must have laws somewhere, right? And so today, I want to explain what God says in his, through His Word about how He has revealed His laws to men, through, to mankind, throughout history. Throughout time, God has unfolded with deeper understanding and greater clarity what His expectations are, what His laws are. And uh, I've provided a little graphic that I hope will be helpful to you. I'll make reference to it several times. It's in your bulletin on that second page, the three concentric circles. We'll be looking at that and talking about it a little bit today. But before we get to it, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this time is yours. This whole time is yours. Our entire lives are yours. But in a special way, this belongs to you. We are together as a corporate people, the body of Christ, come together to give honor to your name. And this time where we look at your word, we submit to it. Um, may it bring us into greater alignment with who you are and your character. In Christ's name. How has God revealed His laws to us? Obviously, um, in the 21st century, here we are, August the 15th, 2021. If I asked you, where did we learn about the laws of God? You would, quite correctly, hold up your Bible and say, right here, this is where we learn. And that's absolutely true. However, what if you lived 3,000 years ago? What would you have said? Well, 3,000 years ago would have been about 1,000 B.C. I'm not that great at math, but I think I'm right. Okay, yeah. 2,000 minus 3,000. All right. 1,000 B.C. You know, at the time, they probably had Genesis... Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, maybe the book of Joshua, maybe the book of Judges, and that's probably it. That's probably all they had. So David, for example, if you asked him, where do you learn the laws of God? You want to obey God, right? Where do you learn? He would have said the Old Testament scriptures, what we have so far. Of course, hundreds of years later, they would have added 1st, 2nd Samuel, Ruth, Isaiah, all the other Old Testament books. But what if you lived 4,000 years ago? What if you lived before the time of Moses? And somebody said, you want to obey God, don't you? Where do you go to to find the laws of God? There's nothing written down. And the first place that we find the law of God revealed is in the outer circle, what we call the moral law. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 2. We're going to take a look at what exactly the moral law is. In Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, Paul writes, I am under obligation." both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise. I'm sorry, that's chapter 1. That's why that did not, that's why like, this didn't sound right. Romans chapter 2. Um, let's actually start in verse 12. 
All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Now I want to I want to paint a very clear picture of what you're reading there. When you read Paul say, the law, you can put it in capital letters if you wanted to, because what he's talking about is the law of Moses. Very specifically, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, with a special emphasis on Exodus through Deuteronomy. That is where... We hear about the Ten Commandments, which we're going to talk about in a moment, the Mosaic Law, and all of those other laws that God revealed to the Levites and all the people. All those laws about when you can work, what you can do, who you can marry, when you can sow your field, all those laws. Paul says in verse 14, when Gentiles, that is, people who have never even heard about who Moses is. Are there still people like that today? There are. There's lots of people in the world that have never picked up a Bible. They have never heard the name of Jesus. They have no idea. If you said, have you ever read the Old Testament, they would look at you like this. They have no idea. He says, when they, who do not have the law, when they do what the law requires... They are revealing something about themselves. They are revealing that there is a particular type of law written on their hearts, seared into their conscience. It's what we today have called the moral law. And I'll just illustrate this very quickly. No matter what culture you go to, Western culture, America, Canada, Europe, Eastern culture, China, Middle Eastern culture, Muslim culture. No matter what culture you go to, no matter what continent you travel to, no matter what era, if you could go back in time to a thousand years ago in Turkey, no matter where you go, there are certain things that everybody has agreed on. Murder is wrong. Yes? If I'm married and you try to take my life, we're going to have words or fists or something. Right? Those are, and I won't go any further because I'm, I'm not trying to preach a whole sermon about this, but everybody, everywhere understands, I mean, no matter where you go, what culture, if you have a house and then somebody that you don't know comes into your house and starts taking your stuff, it's not like you, you don't have to have a law written down that says this is wrong, right? You know it is right here. And Paul says that that natural law, that moral law, is on everybody's heart. Everybody everywhere understands that this is so. And he, and he uses this very interesting phrase. He says it is confirmed by the conscience. Look at verse 15. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. When, when, you do, when you go against your conscience, what you know to be right, your conscience accuses you. You don't have to you don't have to see a sign that says what I just did is wrong. You know it. You feel it in here. And alternatively, if you do what is right and nobody sees you, you kind of feel good about yourself. Why? Nobody saw you do it. Nobody gave you a pat on the back. It's because it's written on your heart that you did the right thing. Now, we have a problem, and that is that our, our consciences can be misinformed. Our consciences can be wounded, 1 Corinthians 8. Our consciences, according to Titus, can be defiled. And 1 Timothy even says that our conscience can be seared. We see this going on a lot in our culture right now, where uh, so many people are saying 
what, what, we, what we know, listen, Caitlyn Jenner is a man, right? And, and not meaning to pick on him, he's just the first one that I thought about. This is not controversial. Ten years ago, everyone would have agreed with me. But our conscience is running so, our nation's conscience, if there is such a thing, is running so fast in the other direction that now to say something that is written on everybody's heart and is obvious is being described as hate speech. And I think what we're seeing on a national level is the searing of our conscience. So that what used to be obviously true, created by God, is now called hateful. Our conscience is being seared. And so what happens is we have this, this moral law written on our hearts from the time that we're born. And when we, do, when we do what's wrong, what the Bible calls sin, that creates a dissonance in the sinner. Um, I, I know I shouldn't do that, but I want to do it anyway, so I'm, I run to do it, and then my conscience accuses me that what I did was wrong, and then I have to rationalize it and say, well, I did it because of this and this and this, kind of like Eve in the garden, right? That snake! And Adam started it, right? That woman! <laughs> I never, it cracks me up. His exact words, the woman that you gave me. Who's he really blaming? He's really blaming God. Sin creates dissonance in us. I know I shouldn't do that. Or sometimes we should do something and we don't do it, right? I know I should do that, but I don't have the moral courage to do it. I don't have the strength to do it. I don't have the will to do it. So we, we don't do it. And then that creates this problem in us. There's this break between our conscience and our actions. Psychologists call that dissonance. Now, one way I want to explain the moral law, what we call the natural law, is it's God's way of saying, you know better. You ever say that to somebody? Parents say this to our kids all the time. Well, you didn't say I couldn't do that. Well, heaven's sake, if I had to have said every single thing that you can or cannot do, and all I would ever do is be standing around giving orders. This is the point of the Old Testament. God said, uh, here's ten basic rules I want you to live by. And then in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, he said, now, in case you're wondering what I mean by the ten rules, here are some examples. But God didn't cover every single thing that happened, did he? Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example from my own personal life. <coughs> And I'll go ahead and tell you beforehand, I'm embarrassed that this happened, but it was really funny. When I was in high school, we went to a small Christian school. And as I got older, I got where I could drive. We actually took our trash out to the dump, and then we take we would take that to these to these big cans, you know, God kind of burn stuff in. And then we would take those cans. And we would dump them in a dumpster, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred yards away, that belonged to a college. We, we, we were co-located on their property, and they allowed us to use their dumpster. Very nice of them, right? Well, I was you know, like one of the goody two-shoes in the school, so <laughs> yes, it's true, I was. So I was allowed privileges. So I was the one that got to get out of school and go dump the trash. So I'd get in my dad's truck, I think it was every Thursday, and me and a buddy would go get the cans, load them onto the back of the truck, and then we would drive to the dumpster and we would dump the trash. Now what we were supposed to do was come straight back. Now you know where the story's going, right? <laughs> but what we normally did is we would keep driving down that road after dumping the trash, we would put the cans to the side, and we would drive down this little dirt road to the gym where we played basketball. Not a dirt road, a gravel road. Gravel road. But that crushed rock that throws powder up in the air. We would drive down there to the gym, and then we would, you know, fool around for as long as we thought we could get away with it, and we'd come back. And nobody was to watch. One day, we were on our little routine. I drove 
We drove the truck down to the dump, dumped the stuff, left the cans inside. We drove down the little gravel, gravel road to where the gym was. And one of the college students, some guy, I, I feel bad about it, I cannot remember his name, was suntanning out in the middle of this gravel spot. And it was a huge gravel spot. He was tan, face down, sunglasses on. I don't know what got in me, but I said, watch this. And you know, those are famous last words, right? Said, watch this. You know something stupid is about to happen. I proceeded to do about five donuts around the guy. Just... <laughs> and dust was everywhere. And he, he got up <laughs> coughing, spitting. And then I sped down the road before he could see me. I figured he wouldn't know who I was. And to this day, I don't know if my dad or the principal ever knew that I did that. But you know how I felt after that? Even though me and my buddy were laughing all the way back. I had just thought to myself, you know better. Were there any rules? Were there any signs up saying no donuts in this parking lot? Not a one. Were there any signs up saying do not Paris harass the college students? Not a one. Were there any signs up saying don't be a jerk? Couldn't find some. But in my heart, I knew that I did wrong. Why? Because it was obvious. You shouldn't have to explain it. But I, I did it anyway. This week I was perusing Twitter and I saw somebody had posted another video of some guy getting sucker punched in Detroit. This, this crowd of surrounds him. He doesn't know what's going on. And then out of nowhere, some guy just hits him and you would think that the people filming this would show compassion, right? They would surround the guy to help him. But what are they doing? You know it. They're laughing. Guys, we have reached a critical stage in this country where our conscience is no longer functioning the way it should. The natural moral law is not doing what it should because it is being seared. And because then the moral law doesn't get through to people, and it, and it didn't. The people of Noah's day that were so wicked, God said, guess what? I, I've had it. I've had it with you. Everybody's going down, except for Noah, you're his wife, and their family. Everybody's dead. They had the natural law. They had the moral law. But when they got a chance, when God rebooted the earth, so to speak, he said, all right, I'm going to do it a little differently this time. The moral law is still in your hearts, but now I'm going to reveal my laws even more fully to you. I'm going to give you ten commandments. And he did it. He gave Moses and the people of Israel the ten commandments, which are the Mosaic law. Uh, we see this in Exodus chapter 20. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven image. You shall not. You shall honor the Sabbath day. You shall not um, take my name in vain. Honor your father and mother. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not covet. Do not steal. Those are the Ten Commandments. And they, what they do is, uh, the moral law written on your heart is spelled out more fully in the Mosaic Law. The Ten Commandments. And it's like as if, if the moral law said, you know better, this should be obvious. The Mosaic Law says, let me spell it out for you. You thick-headed ignorance. <laughs> because we are thick-headed. We are ignorances. God gave explicit rules about how people should live and how they should not live. But when you go back and read Old Testament history, what happened in the book of Joshua, what happened in the book of Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, did they obey? They manifestly did not. I mean, they had a few mountaintop experiences, but for the most part, the people of God stayed in the valley. They disobeyed the law of God. Which goes to show that even when God spells it out for us, it's still hard to obey, isn't it? It's very hard. Can we be honest? And, I, and I'll give another illustration, this time from one of my kids. Some months ago, I, I don't remember how long ago now, it's been probably 10 months or so, I was 
away on one of my army duties because these types of things always happen when I'm gone. <laughs> Ask Nanny, she'll tell you. It was a Sunday morning. Natalie woke up, and um, let's just say, I wake up happy and cheery. Natalie is the opposite type of person. It's not that she's in a bad mood, but she just takes a while to get revved up. And um, she wakes up, and of course, in her mind, the main event is getting the children ready for church, which is an ordeal, especially when she's by herself. Well, she goes into one of the rooms, and she finds a little pile of blonde hair sitting there. And she probably had the same thought that you just had. Whose hair did she find? And it was Tiana's. And guess who cut it? It was Mercy. We named her right. Lord have mercy. Well, I was not there to help with the problem, but it's never good on a Sunday morning when I'm at Fort Jackson and I receive a text that's this long, all caps, with uh, exclamation points interspersed throughout. So I said, calm down. She's only five, and she'll learn from this. Just make sure she understands. And I don't remember if Natalie spanked her or not. She deserved it, but but um, she probably did. <laughs> Sam says she did? OK. So she got a spanking, she got a tongue lashing, and she got explicit instruction. And I remember this, do not touch the scissors. It wasn't just don't cut hair. It was do not touch the scissors. Fast forward. About six months. Seven months. <laughs> Guess where I am? Once again, I'm at Fort Jackson. And I get another one of these texts. Boom! This time, Complete with pictures. Sianna had been carefully put to bed the night before with rollers in her hair. Well, they got up as they are wont to do before Natalie and are messing around in the, uh, the playroom. It's actually the schoolroom, but we call it the playroom too. And Sianna says to Mercy, I need to get the rollers out of my hair. Well, Mercy can't figure out how to get the rollers out of her hair, but she knows one way to do it. Guess what she touched that she shouldn't have touched? Scissors. The scissors. <laughs> Mama was displeased, to say the least. Now, I lay that illustration out because we like to think we're different than Mercy, but we're really not. How many times do we have to be told in Scripture, love your neighbor? Yes, Lord, you're right. And then we don't do it again. How many times are we told, forgive those who have wronged you? And then we hold a grudge. Oh, Lord, I did it again. How many times are we told, uh, treat husbands, love your wives, wives, submit to your husband, and we... Oh, Lord, I did it again. How many times have we told children, obey your parents, honor your parents, and oh, guys, it is spelled out for us very clearly, and yet we have no will to obey outside of Christ. None. <coughs> Which leads me to the third law, something I have sort of coordinately called the mega law, <laughs> just to make it go with the M's. It's the law of love. Mega meaning the greatest law. The greatest command. For this, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 12. And I want you to look at it. By the way, if you're not in the habit of bringing your Bible, you should be. This is God's house, and there's no way for you to compare what I'm saying with uh, what the Bible actually says. Unless you have it, you ought to bring your Bible. But the mega law, when, 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 when the when the lawyer and the scribe comes up to Jesus in verse 28 and says, which commandment is the most important? The word's most important is the word mega in Greek. And we use mega all the time. That thing's, that thing's a mega lift. That thing's huge. It means the biggest, the most important. 
And uh, Jesus responded with these important words. He said, the most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment, mega, greater than these. And when the scribe agrees with Jesus, Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Down in verse 30, you're not far. Now, this is important. Jesus says, the greatest law, the, the, the innermost circle, the one where the heart of God is found, is love. Love God first. Love the right God. And he says, uh, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. We've got to love the right God. Muslims love God, but they don't love the right God. Mormons love God, but they don't love the right God. We have to love the right God. But then we have to, in order to obey the law, this sounds contradic kind of contradictory, doesn't it? When I am driving down the interstate and I see a 70 degree, uh, 70 miles per hour sign, it is not love that compels me to obey that. And yet Jesus here says that the center most ring where the heart of God is found, that it helps explain the Mosaic law that truly digs down and explains the natural law is not ironclad obedience, not grin and bear it obedience, not grit your teeth and get through it willpower, but love. Love for God. <clears throat> love for others. And when you think about the Ten Commandments, this makes a lot of sense. The first four commandments, no other gods, no graven images, don't take His name in vain, honor the Sabbath, they all concern our love for who? God. The last six commandments, um, don't commit adultery, honor your parents, don't lie, all the us. They concern our love for <laughs> Love is the foundation for the Mosaic law. And we have lots of examples of this in the New Testament. Um, Ephesians 4 says, put away falsehood and speak truth with your neighbor. Why should you tell the truth? Because you love your neighbor. You don't want to lie to them. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Why should we not tell your dirty jokes? Because we love our neighbor. Sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. Why should I... Why should I be faithful to my wife? Well, because I love her. Or even if I were single, why should I keep sexual relationships for marriage? Because I love that person. You might say, well, that's not how that works, Pastor. It's exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. It's exactly how it works. When we take what does not belong to us before the appointed time, we are showing that we don't understand love as much as we think we do. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Why not, Lord? I'm just hurting myself. No, you're hurting other people too. And you're not showing that you love God. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. I'll be the first to admit, it is not easy to do these things. But when we view everything through the concentric lens of love, boy, that changes how I view the law. Changes how I view God's laws. Why did God issue all these commands and many others? Well, because He loves you. Because He loves everyone He made. And obeying these commands is the best thing for you and for them. As a Christian, obeying God's commands demonstrates love for God and for His creation. But, but I want to go one step further, and that is this. Even if you did this, even if you, 
you, you, you understood the moral law and you listened to your conscience and you didn't go against your conscience. And even if you understood the Ten Commandments and you tried your very best to obey them, and even if you tried your very best to love others and love God the way you should, you would still fail. And that's the truth. Because I failed. And I tried. And that's where this is so important. The law of love and obedience to God is revealed. Wait for it. In Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus said in Matthew 5.17, I want you to throw this up on the screen. Matthew 5.17, Jesus said this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Who is the only person that ever loved God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength? Jesus. Who is the only person that ever fully loved others like he loved himself? Jesus. Who is the only person, in other words, who has ever truly kept the law of God? Jesus. His very coming was an act of love. His mission was... That is, his humility, his obedience, his rejection, and his death was an act of love. And so, I would try to conclude with this thought. When your heart is aligned with God's heart, obedience becomes a joy. And our heart becomes aligned with God's when we rest in Christ. When we see Jesus in all of his glory for who he truly was. Gosh, Jesus didn't just come and die on a cross and go back to heaven. He kept this burden of a law which can only condemn us. Let's be honest. All the law can do is condemn us. It can't save us. He did. He executed the mission with 100% effectiveness for us so that we could be saved. So I would ask, as always, there's two categories of people in here. There are people who are saved, and there are people who are unsaved. And, and, and if you're unsaved, you've never aligned your heart with God's to begin with. You are dead, according to Ephesians, in trespasses and sins. You remain an enemy of God, and you stand outside of His grace. That is a very perilous place to be because as we learned last week, our God is a consuming fire. And He will deal out wrath and judgment on those who choose to face Him on the basis of their own works. Maybe that's you. If it is, I plead to turn to Christ today. He stands at your door and knocks he desires you to be saved. And He did it. He obeyed the law for you. He obeyed the moral law. He obeyed the Mosaic law. And He obeyed the mega law of love. So that you might be dressed in His robes of righteousness. But you must be born again. But for the rest of us, the ones who have trusted in Christ, we are clothed in His righteousness. We understand that at the judgment seat, we will not stand before God based on our own works, but based on the works of Christ. Let me ask you this. Are you aligning your heart with God's? Because we, we have to get past the moral law. We have to get past the you ought to know better stage. And we have to get past the Mosaic law and say, well, if I do this, 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 then I'll be right with God. And we have to get to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter, which is, are we loving God and are we loving His people? All people for that matter. And I would just ask you this, what are you feeding your heart? You know, every day you feed your heart. Every day. When you go home this week, you're going to feed your heart. You're going to feed your heart uh, what you listen to on the radio. You're going to feed your heart... Fox News, or CNN, or MSNBC, whatever it is that you watch. You're going to feed your heart whatever it is you watch on YouTube or TikTok. You're going to feed your heart what you scroll through on Instagram. Everything that you do is feeding your heart something. 
and leading you towards either greater love for God and others or more selfishness. And if you go that way, you're not going to be aligned with God's heart and His will for you. You're going to find your conscience being bothered. Why? Because you're going to be living in sin, which creates that dissonance, that, that separation between you and God. You don't want that. You want to live a life pleasing to God. You want to live a life where your conscience is clear. And there's, there's nothing that can, there's nothing quite like a clear conscience, is there? That's a beautiful thing. That's wonderful. Submit to Christ daily. And remember this. 1 John 4, 19. I'll close with this. We love Him. Why? Because He did what? He first loved us. Shall we pray? Father in Heaven, we give this invitation time.